I'm Patrick Pacheco. Coming up on Theater All the Moving Parts, a chat with Tony winning orchestrator Michael Sterabin, the behind the scenes master of emotion in any show. Hello, and welcome to this virtual episode of Theater All the Moving Parts. If you've ever found yourself an emotional wreck at a musical, chances are it's due to the work of the show's orchestrator. Having won Tony's for Next to Normal and Assassins, Michael Sterbin is a pro at interpreting the composer's intentions and enhancing the emotional urgency of any scene. Welcome, Michael, to Theater All the Moving Parts. It is such a delight to have you on the show. Thank you for having me here. You once stated that I view instruments as a company of actors. How does that explain what you do as an orchestrator? In a, a company, in particular, a rep company of actors, the same actors play different roles, but you cast them by certain natural inherent qualities. They're, the actor's physicality, the sound of their voice. There's one actor who's always great at doing the romantic leads, even though sometimes you'll work against that and put them in a comic character role. It's a very much the same thing with the instruments. Each instrument has inherent qualities that we consider, the flute, we consider a very pastoral, sweet sound. We consider the oboe a very lyrical, uh, you know, plangent sound. But we can also cast against character and have the oboe do something silly and funny. So all the instruments are like character actors for me who can play different roles, sometimes going against type, sometimes going with type. And as the years go by and I work with them more and more, I know my company better and better. And that includes electronic sounds or some electronic sounds I use for many years that I have the same feelings about their qualities that I can apply to certain situations. So I gather like actors, the role of the art orchestrator is to divine the intentions of both the composer and the lyricist, that you literally have to be an actor as an orchestrator. Like any designer in the theater, you're a storyteller. I mean, that's why those of us who work in the theater prefer to do it than film in that we're there in the room with the other, with the writers presenting their story, expanding it, coloring it, opening it up to the audience. So that storytelling goes through everything, lyrics, books, and we just take the composer's choices as an orchestrator. I take the composer's choices to respond to that story and continue them into orchestral color and sometimes into more complicated orchestral textures with counterpoints. And what you do also is that you continue thought and emotion beyond what the singer, the actor is actually saying or singing at any given time, correct? It's a total through line. Yes. Uh, I mean, an actor sings lyrics that are lines grouped together as verses and choruses, but they have to breathe. But the emotions they're feeling are continuous. And so it's my job to, even as they're breathing, to continue their thoughts and emotions to go over the page. You can hear when an orchestrator hasn't done that, has stopped and didn't do anything going into the next verse. You hear a page turn. And that's something I don't like to hear in, in my orchestrations. I like the thought process, the dramatic story to continue and be moving forward always. And can it all, not only be moving forward, but can you set up the next uh, level of emotion in terms of going perhaps a little further? What you're describing is a little dangerous in that it can give away what's coming up. For instance, you don't telegraph a joke. Uh -huh. You never do funny music when an actor is saying a funny lyric. A joke is really about language. You may do a reaction that goes with the audience's reaction to the line, um, 
but you don't anticipate. You may anticipate the feelings that are gestating and coming up. There's a spot in um, We Do Not Belong Together where I have a scale that goes high towards the very end of the number. And for me, that was dot sort of reaching the feeling like, this is useless. I'm not going to fight with George anymore. It's time to go. Um, but it doesn't enunciate it so much. It just sort of lightens everything so that as Stephen goes into the next vamp, there's this feeling of, oh, this is different now. We're talking, of course, about Sunday in the Park with George. Please. Yes. You are complete, George. You all alone. I am unfinished. I am diminished. With or without you, we do not belong together, and we should have belonged together. What made it so right together? What made it all wrong? So th there are times where you can anticipate the processes thought and emotions that are going on in a character and try and present them. But you do not want to do the work for the actor. What I, all the things I'm describing are not doing their work, but accompanying their work. It's almost like they're a surfer and I'm just trying to provide the wave for them to surf on. You were good enough to do a little demonstration video for us. Michael, can you explain to us what the video is about? Uh, this is a video I prepared that shows the process of orchestration, taking the song, the title song of the show, Flying Over Sunset, from the piano vocal that Tom Kitt gave me at the beginning of rehearsals, showing it sung with just piano in workshop, and then how it turns into the orchestration uh, in actual performance, sung both times by Carmen Cusack. Great. Let's take a look at a passage from the title song, Flying Over Sunset, sung by the character of Claire Booth Luce as she is taking LSD for the very first time. We'll focus in on just the second chorus of the number and listen to it in both the unorchestrated version performed in rehearsal and then the fully orchestrated version as performed on stage. As we look at the piano vocal written by Tom Kitt with lyrics by Michael Corey, we see that the accompaniment is quite pianistic, consisting of a rocking figure that energetically captures the soaring feelings of flight that Claire is experiencing. The brief for the orchestrator is much more than just staying true to the notes on the page. I am orchestrating Michael's lyric as much as Tom's music. The lyric draws a picture of Claire flying through the air on a westward journey over Los Angeles, ending at the Pacific in the sunset, bright with gold. One of the jobs for an orchestrator is to keep the thought and passions of the character flowing, even when the vocal stops to take a breath. The orchestra fills the spaces in the vocal, so the sense of what the character is expressing is continuous. For both the composer and the orchestrator, the passion inherent in the language becomes musical passion that can function outside the grammar of the sung lyrics. Let's listen to this passage one more time with the vocal pushed into the background to get a better sense of the orchestral colors and figures. The piano part remains true to Tom's original with a minimum of changes, but his use of moving figures to catch the sense of flying are echoed elsewhere in the orchestra.
you started out actually as a classical, uh, you know, a student, classical composer and yes. rock. Uh, you sort of came into it. You grew up in uh, Long Island and then Great Neck and went to Bennington. And you grew up with Bill Finn. I didn't uh, grow up with Billy, but met him soon after I got to city after to the city after college. We sort of started at the beginning together um, and it was very beneficial for both of us. We both sort of learned the cre uh, to create shows together. Uh, him as a, a, as a composer lyricist, myself as a music director orchestrator at the time. Uh, and then we were both lucky enough to get involved with James Lapine on March of the Falsettos. What did you learn from Bill Finn that carried you through as an orchestrator? Well, the thing, Billy doesn't know the rules and of, of you know, and he doesn't follow the rules because I, I don't think he knows them because he has his own rules that made sense to him. So he also did not come out of the tradition of, you know, learn to write like Rodgers and Hammerstein, then learn how to write like Stephen Sondheim. He did his own thing. And what I learned from that is that Later on, I did have to learn the rules to do more traditional type of musicals, but I also learned that you can do things without the rules. You can do things not the way theater is expected to be, not the way music is expected to be, because Billy's lyric writing and shaping of shows was so unusual and different that no one could really imitate him because it's it's really a one-of-a-kind thing. Um, and I also learned from that to go with what that composer is doing, their vision, their sound, their structuring of a song, their structuring of a show can be very different. I mean, the thing about Sondheim is he changes who he is as a composer for each project to fit the subject matter. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes important to not dig yourself into the same thing that you always do, but find a new way to do it that fits each project. Uh, and Jonathan Tunick, who could not, who was Sondheim's usual orchestrator, could not do Sunday in the Park with George, recommended right. you. Why do you suppose he recommended you? And did you have any second thoughts about accepting the job? I'm not sure why Jonathan recommended me. Maybe he had seen some of my work on March of the Falsettos and thought it was unusual. Um, but the other, the second rehearsal pianist was Tom Fay. He w was also up for the job. Um, I was lucky enough, be mostly through James Lapine's urging. That's how I really got the job, because James knew me from March of the Falsettos, which we had done together. I was the only person in the music department who wasn't a stranger to him. You auditioned for Sondheim, obviously. Uh, did, you arranged yes. a couple of songs. And he said in one song that you over-decorated. What does yes. over-decorating mean in the orchestration world? It means too many fills. It means not staying as faithful to Stephen's original keyboard part. Um, it means getting too busy. Uh -huh. And I tend to be busy as an orchestrator. I mean, if you talk to my peers and say, who's the busiest orchestrator? They'll, they'll say me. I tend to do a lot of counterpoint. I tend to get a little busy and it's both my strength and my weakness. You actually, I think, uh, orchestrated for 11 instruments. Is that correct? That's for correct. For yeah. Sunday in the Park with George. Because the economics keep saying less and less and less. Um, do you find that a help or a hindrance? Oh, of course it's a hindrance. I mean, there's no, uh, to it. no, there's no, there's no positive thing to having less instruments except for budgetary reasons. Right. You know, um, and I was uh, doing spelling bee and we were moving from off Broadway to Broadway and the producer, and I asked the producer, we just used a guitar on the cast album. Sounded great. Can we have one for the, and he said, do you want your guitar? and go from five pieces to six pieces? Or do you want the show to run two or three months longer? Because my nut will be that, my weekly nut will be that much smaller. And I couldn't argue with him. He was right. Would the show have sounded better with the guitar? Absolutely. Would shows sound better with larger orchestras? 
Absolutely. Because you have more color, you have more ability to try and do things. Um, but that's just not the economics of Broadway. Economics, partly the value of what producers think is important is the other thing. They sent, tend to think a big set that moves is more important. When you know that you've only got 11 instruments, how do you go about choosing those instruments? Well, the first question I always ask myself, is this a dance show? Because if it's a dance show, it immediately says, I have to have loud rhythmic music. So it says, one, I have to have a drum set. I have to have three or four winds, one of which will be a trumpet to, to be loud and the music to dance. If it's not a dance show and it's a very acoustic show, I might go without drums even. Then it's, do I need strings? Do I, do I want something unusual like the harp, which I've used in a couple of shows recently, including Flying Over Sunset? Um, I, look at the, I look at what the show requires. Is it rhythmic? Is it pop? And the style will determine a lot of what I'm going to use for the orchestra. You mentioned Hallett earlier, and I think it was Paul Gemignani, the Dean of Musical Directors, who said that the thing you can talk to with Michael is colors. You can talk colors with Michael. What did he mean by that when it comes to orchestrations? I don't think he was particularly talking about instrumental color. He, I think he was talking about dramatic color, like, oh, this scene needs to be darker. This scene needs, you know, he would talk about what the characters are feeling and, and I would, and to influence the colors I came up with. Um, occasionally we were working together on scores that were my less experienced composers that did not respond as well to what was going on dramatically. And he would push me to like darken this number a little, you know, make, make this number more dramatic to fit the situation than what the composer had come up with. And which sometimes, sometimes you have to help out a composer who's less experienced. What you, you mentioned earlier, what in terms of the palette, with the darker colors, and you worked, worked obviously on Assassins, uh, which of course was very dark in subject matter and yet had a musical theater lightness to the songs that yes. Anaim gave you. How do you, balance that in orchestrations? Well, Assassins was a tough call because it's a review. Each song is coming from a different era, a different style. So it was really challenging to come up with an orchestra to cover all that. But the lightness wasn't hard. The lightness was the humor about it. I mean, that's wonder so wonderful about what Stephen and John Weidman had done is that this horrible, traumatic story told through these very funny, but still tragic songs um, about the American experience and the dark side of the American dream. I am unworthy of your love, Jody, Jody. Tom Kitt, obviously, you've worked with before on Next to Normal, one of your Tony wins. How did the darkness, say, of Next to Normal compare to the darkness of Assassins in terms of the emotional palette? Next to Normal is a, a much darker palette. I mean, the dark palette in Assassin shows up in Something Just Broke, but otherwise it, it, it's really more of a carnival. Next to Normal is, is this emotional story about mental illness that Really, you're living through the pain and suffering of a family coming apart. And Tom's use of rock and roll, different rock and roll styles and classical styles within that score is just ingenious to capture the emotions of, of the, the characters and what they're going through at different times. So, and the challenge for that was also Tom is a very good, accomplished orchestrator. Himself. So... We have a co-orchestration credit on that because a lot of his rhythm section work I kept because he's a master at working with the rhythm section. Um, and so that show, if anything, was a real education to me to steal from him. He always says he steals from me. I steal from everybody I work with. I mean, 
orchestrators very often don't have enough time to finish a show and ask another orchestrator to do a number or two. Um, and when you do, you have their scores in front of you that they did for your show and you learn from looking at them. When you heard a uh, red, uh, in the script that Flying Over Sunset would involve the three main characters tripping on LSD. What mm. immediately came to mind that you were going to orchestrate this music of uh, people tripping on acid? Wow, this will be great fun to do. The moment you're tripping on acid, you're doing something in, in, in the context of a story, you're doing something that all the boundaries are loosened. Um, so I do stuff with polytonality, things out of tune occasionally. I, I, it let us have a lot of fun just, you know, challenging the ear. And James, as director, wanted us to like really challenge. He had set up the show that the songs only occur when someone is tripping. Mm -hmm. So it gave us an opportunity in the score to really have fun, do some crazy things. In addition to the... 14 piece orchestra or 13 piece, I have electronic sounds that sort of, you know, just sort of play out like shimmering textures that are part of what's going on in these numbers. How does the shimmer of Sunday in the Park with George differ from the shimmer I felt, I, I felt and heard in Flying Over Sunset? The difference between Sunday in the Park a show where I was also going out on a ledge and trying anything I wanted to do, mostly because I was 26 and had no idea what I was supposed to do. And, and flying over sunset, which I orchestrated at the age of, well, I really did it two years ago. So I have to say the age <laughs> of 63, not five. And the difference in those 40 years is experience control and if you say it still shimmers, then I still have something of what I had at 26, which I worry about losing because that's the orchestration that everyone will remember me for. Um, and so you, you try to keep moving forward, but you just try to stay true to the show. And if there's a shimmer there, it's because maybe I know what I'm doing, which it has taken 40 years to convince myself that I know what I'm doing. We have to wrap up, but I want to ask you, having worked with Stephen Sondheim from Sunday in the Park with George through Assassins and other shows, what was the first thing you did when you learned of his death? Tried to call Paul Gemignani, make sure he knew, um, but I, because I got the call from James Lapine, but I think James had already called him. I got an answering machine because he just, Paul couldn't deal with it for, couldn't deal with talking to anybody at first. Um, then I just thought how much I'll miss him. I'll miss, I'll miss the person I was friends with, you know, more than the shows because he left us with so many wonderful shows um, and the shows are still there. Nothing's taken them away. But I'm going to miss the guy who, you know, when he discovered I was into odd movies, had to tell me which movies he loved. And I told him which I loved. Um, and who, when I, you know, all when I was going through um, my work on Flying Over Sunset, I kept thinking, oh, wait till Stephen hears this, wait till Stephen hears that. And I continued to say that to myself once he was gone. He went, oh, he's not going to hear it which was such such a tragic disappointment. Um, but his, his work lives on. His work is, you know, he's, you know, you can't predict what someone's going to be in history, but I think there's a good chance that he will be the Shakespeare of the musical theater. Uh, I have to tell you that the first thing I did was play Sunday in the Park with George, your no. creations for Sunday in the Park with George, and especially that, you know, finale. Um, right. Both the first act finale and the second act finale, which always reduces not only me, but I'm sure everybody else right. to a basket case. So uh, I'm sure you must be gratified that uh, with that work that you've done on, on Sunday, as well as all the other shows. Yes.
Yes, very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we could have gone on for another hour, as you probably know. Sure. But uh, congratulations. I think we should probably say that Flying Over Sunset has been recorded, and the CD should come out in March, and the digital will be released even six weeks before that, I believe. Or I so. hope so. So we can enjoy the shimmering, uh, lovely uh, music, and boy, is it ever beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more fascinating conversations with artists and thought leaders as theater, that fabulous invalid, regains its invaluable place in American culture. I'm Patrick Pacheco.